1 Samuel chapter 28. Get into the Lord's Word tonight. Continuing talking on the subject, the tale of two kings, Saul and David, tonight. And if the Lord allows, next Sunday, that'll be the last one, as we'll get to the end of Saul's life and see how that all finishes out. Well, we've seen through these weeks two distinct examples of character. Um, We mark the characteristics of each man, and uh, we ought to be wise enough to learn from both. Um, I've been taught since I was a teen that I don't have to make all the mistakes on my own. I can learn from others' mistakes. That's wise. And um, I wish I had learned, you know, uh, more from others', others mistakes and, and made less of my own. Um, but like he just sang about, I'm thankful that when I did, you know, the Lord didn't cast me aside. And uh, I'm thankful for that. But we can learn. We can learn from positive example, and we can learn from negative example. And so we're going to be in chapter 28, but there are three chapters between what we uh, looked at last week and tonight. And so I'll give you a synopsis of what's in those three chapters that leads up to uh, what we'll see tonight. Chapter 25 is about the death of Samuel. It begins with the death of Samuel uh, in that chapter. Uh, David then asks a man named Nabal to help him by feeding him and his men while they're running from Saul. Uh, David and his men had protected all of Nabal's, Nabal's shepherds and servants when they were out in the fields. David's men were, uh, would surround Nabal's shepherds and his flocks to make sure that nothing happened to them. So he did a good favor for Nabal. And so he went to Nabal and asked if he would help feed him and his men. And uh, Nabal said he would not help him. And what we need to know about uh, Nabal is that he was uh, a man who the Bible calls the son of Belial. He was a drunk. He just had a nasty attitude. Uh, he said he wouldn't help David. So what David does, does is he says, all right, I need 400 of our men to take your swords. We're going to go talk to Nabal. <laughs> and uh, he leaves 200 of his men back to guard all of their stuff. On his way uh, to get to Nabal... Abigail, Nabal's wife, uh, finds out what had happened, and so she secretly goes to David and brings him and his men nourishment because she's appreciative of what David and his men did. Um, She says, my husband is exactly what his name means, and the word Nabal just simply means fool, and she said, my husband is a fool, he's a drunk fool, and so I apologize for the way he's treated you. Thank you for the good that you've done for our family. Here is the nourishment for you and your men. Well, Nabal finally dies due to his wild living. Even just 10 days after the interaction with David, Nabal dies. And um, uh, David actually takes Abigail as his wife. And so chapter 26. um, It's kind of similar to the events in, in what we saw last week when David had an opportunity to take Saul out, uh, but he chose not to. Same sort of scenario, different place. Um, Saul and his men are in a place and a position uh, where David has an opportunity to kill him. His, he and his men are just sleeping there in a valley. And uh, David and some of his men come upon them and they take Saul's spear and his canteen. And they go back to the other side and they yell for Saul and his men. And David kind of has an indictment on Saul's uh, bodyguard. And he says, hey, you're not, some, you're not, you're not much of a bodyguard. Uh, we've got your, your no, we got Saul's canister and his uh, spear here. And so kind of shows him that once again he could have uh, ended it all if he wanted to, but that he restrained. Um, Saul uh, realizes that David has been good to him and he goes back from trying to kill David again. So he refuses to go after David at this point. Chapter 27, David now flees to Gath. Now, Gath is where Goliath is from, and so it's a stronghold of the Philistines. Now, Saul finds out that David's in Gath, but he will not go after David because then he'd not just be picking a fight with David and his men, he'd also be picking a fight with uh, the Philistines. So he does not go after David this time. Now, David and his men stay among the Philistines for a year and four months, and while there, David goes out and destroys some of the original inhabitants of the land that was promised to them by God, and takes their herds and flocks for himself. And all of that brings us up to chapter 28, where we'll begin tonight. 
So we will read verses 1 through 6 to get started. We'll comment and then we'll go through the rest of the chapter, Lord willing. Okay, 1 Samuel 28 beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together, and came, and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. And so we see here that David, as we said, he had been in Gath with the Philistines for a year and four months. And he's having a conversation with the king of the Philistines named Achish. This is the guy we find out about in verse 1. The Philistines, as we saw there, and the Israelites are getting ready to go to battle. They're getting ready to go to battle against one another. And David and his men go with Achish to fight against Israel. How sad is it that David, who loved Israel and loved the people of Israel, had to resort to this tactic, almost like a gang mentality, just to stay alive. And, but he does. He's there in, um, in Gath with the Philistines, and he decides he's going to fight with them. And I want us to notice something uh, in verses 1 and 2 that I think speaks to David's character. Look at that with me again. It says, And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines were, uh, gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish the king, that is, said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. In other words, he said, you know, how, you know what kind of a warrior I am. You know I can fight. You know I can take care of myself and others. Um, you've heard of me, I'm sure. Certainly he had. He had killed their great warrior years ago in Goliath. And so what does Achish do in verse 2? And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee the keeper of mine head forever. David becomes Achish's bodyguard. Isn't that interesting? That an enemy, a sworn enemy of the Philistines, becomes the bodyguard of the leader of the Philistines. Now how interesting is that? That speaks to David's character. Because he didn't think that David was up to um, some kind of... uh, coup or assassination plot and at the whole time he was just waiting to take him out he really believed David David over that year and four months had earned his trust and demonstrated that he had character and was trustworthy and so even an enemy had good rapport with the people of Philist- the Philistines now that tells you and me as again we're this isn't our home we're strangers in this world but you and I should have good rapport with the lost We should have a good testimony with the lost. They should know that we are trustworthy. They should know that when we give our word, we will keep it. They should know that when we say we will do something, that we will follow through on it. And so David shows some character here in the way that he dealt with people. And so much so that his very enemies uh, knew that he was trustworthy and had character. And um, a good lesson for all of us there as we see there in David. Now verse 3 reminds us that Samuel is dead. And it also reminds us, as a way of foreshadowing as to what's to come in this chapter, that Saul had gotten rid of uh, those who had familiar spirits and the wizards in the land, uh, the mediums, those who would um, talk to dead spirits and things like that. So Saul had gotten rid of the mediums and the spiritists in the land. Now that was a a, uh, command by God. Keep your finger there in 1 Samuel and turn with me to Deuteronomy 18. And we'll see that. Deuteronomy 18. All right, Deuteronomy 18, beginning in verse 9. Instructions to the Israelites here. 
Deuteronomy 18.9 says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And so the Bible says, don't partake of these abominable acts of the people who are living in the land that I will give to you. And in fact, drive them out. Don't allow them in your land. Don't allow them to be around. So it's a command of God for his people. And so we see that Saul had actually done that. He had gotten rid of them and cast them out of the land there. As a reminder. Now we come to verse 4. And it says uh, that these, these two armies, it tells us where they are, Shunem and Gilboa. Now those uh, two places are about five miles apart. Um, and there's kind of a valley in between them, kind of like they would do back in those days when they would assemble for battle. So they're about five miles apart. Verse 5 tells us that when Saul looked at the host of the Philistines, that he became afraid and that his heart trembled with fear. Uh, Saul is a fearful man. Uh, fear and jealousy often go hand in hand. And uh, he was very afraid of what he saw. Um, unlike David, remember when he looked at Goliath, he didn't see a giant. He saw uh, God in light of, Je- of Goliath and saw that, in fact, Goliath was nothing when compared to God. Saul, however, when he looked at the Philistine army, he, he was afraid because he thought there's no way we can defeat them. He was a fearful man. Uh, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, if we have a spirit of fear, Brothers and sisters, we can be sure that that's not of God. Um, God wouldn't cause us to fear in this way. Now, there's a, a level of respect we should have for God and for some things, right? Um, for example, you know, uh, if, if there's a lion loose in this room, I'm not going to just walk up to it and try to take it out. You know, I need to be respectful of things like that. But we, we certainly do not need to live in fear. And especially when it comes to matters of um, serving the Lord And we look at the enemy. We look at uh, the obstacles. We don't need to be afraid because our God is greater. And we have uh, many examples in the Word of God of how God, even when it didn't make sense, God, even when when His people were the underdog, how God uh, gave them the victory. And so we have many examples. We even have contemporary examples of people that we've known throughout the ages and here uh, in our own lives. We've seen God do great things. And so we should not be afraid. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Doesn't that sound good? A sound mind. That's the kind of spirit that God gives us. And so we can be certain that if we're afraid, that's not of God. And Saul was a man who was very fearful in his ways. And so we need to learn that God is greater and take that into any situation in our life. We come to verse 6 there. And now notice this. This is where we start to get into the the crux of this chapter. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now, the Lord didn't answer Saul when Saul attempted to ask for the Lord's will concerning the war. God did not speak to Saul in dreams. He refrained from giving him his will. Uh, God did not speak to Saul through what it calls there, Urim. Now, uh, the Bible tells us in Exodus 28, 30, all about Urim there and what that was for. Urim and Thummim were two small plates or stones or flat stones um, contained in the priest's ephod. It was kind of their breastplate. And those two stones were used uh, to determine determine God's will in national matters. Certain national matters they could ask God and those stones would change color or light up or whatever the case may be to, to, to determine God's will for the nation. Only the priest was to use these and they were used to take the decision out of man's hands and out of the people's hands and place the decisions in the hand of God. Uh, They were for yes or no answers. Um, 
Urim and Thummim. Now that sounds a little strange to you and me that, that God would give them some stones that would change color or light up so that they would know how God was speaking to them. But that's how God chose in that era, in that time, uh, to give Israel answers when they were wondering what God would have them to do. And so Saul went to someone, one of the priests probably, or maybe he did it himself, and Urim, God would not give an answer through that either. So God is clearly shutting off Saul and showing him that he's finished with him. No, no answer. And then we find out at the end of verse 6 that he wouldn't speak to him by the prophets either. Even the prophets wouldn't give him an answer from the Lord. It is clear that God has abandoned Saul at this point. Saul, as we will see, is at the very end of his life. It is now time for God to transition the leadership of the nation of Israel to David. And so God has closed that door of communication with Saul. And how sad that it is that that had to come to that. But he certainly did. And and we can't deny that what we see here. Now verse 7. Here's where it gets back to Saul doing Saul things, if you will. Verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. Now, We read in Deuteronomy where God said, don't have them people in your land. Don't even have them in your land. And we also read in this chapter that Saul had cast them out. And so he goes to his servants and he says, go find me a woman who can uh, uh, bring back the dead so I can ask somebody a question. A medium, if you will. Go find me one of those. Now I find this interesting. Watch this, verse 7. And uh, and his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Does that strike anybody as odd? That it happened like that? They knew right where to find a witch. They knew right where to find this medium. You know, Saul is messed up at this point, but at some point you would have thought, he would have said, how do you know that? That fat, you know. Uh, But that's a problem, isn't it? Clearly, they hadn't really been eradicated because somebody had been dealing with these mediums. And so his servants knew exactly where to go. And Saul asks uh, to find this medium so he can get answers. He is not getting answers from God, and now he's willing to resort to going to a medium. Now, Endor is in the territory of Manasseh, which was not under Israelite control technically, at this time, you could just see how messy it is. On a technicality, she wasn't in Israel, but she really was. It was still part of the original land that was given to them. So you can just see how messy everything is right now under Saul's leadership. Now, we, we've read that Saul is afraid. And when we are afraid, we tend to go to places and do things that we would not normally go and do. Fear will drive us to do some pretty strange things, won't it? Uh, Psalm 118.6 says this, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Well, that's a great thought, isn't it? The Lord is on my side. If you're born again, he's in you. Why should I be afraid? What man can do unto me? That's Psalm 118.6. Hebrews 13.6 says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. This should be the attitude of God's people. God is in us. God is with us. We should not fear what man can do unto us, because God's got that all under control. But Saul, in his fear, was willing to go consult a medium. Now, there's a television show. Um, See the commercials for it sometime, called Long Island Medium. It's about this lady who contacts the dead for people and I don't know if it's hocus pocus or if she really has some kind of satanic power I don't know but I know this stay away from that stay away from it it's not interesting don't be curious about it get it off of your television now that's not brother Keller's preference that's the word of God you see don't get involved in that kind of stuff I tell our teens all the time stay away from anything that has to do with the cult or satanic power don't even get involved in it. Just, you, you, you stick with God and his word and you'll know everything you need to know. Okay? You'll have everything you need. Don't get involved in it. That's not, it's not healthy. 
for God's people to be involved in that stuff. It's just not. And in fact, it's, it's blatantly against the law uh, here for God's people. But Saul was willing, in his fear and his confusion, he was willing to go to a medium. Look at verse 8. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, <clears throat> and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. That word divine means using magic to evoke the dead. <clears throat> Saul knew exactly what he was asking for. And he goes to this woman by night, he disguised himself. And if there's anything I've learned in my life, it's this. If I have to sneak around to do something, it's not a good idea. Oh, it's different. You know, if you're trying to sneak around and buy your wife a gift or, you know, <laughs> sneak and buy somebody. You're doing something good for somebody. That's a different story. But if you're sneaking around and you don't want people to see what you're doing, that's probably not a good thing. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where if you have to look over your shoulder, that should be a clue. Saul had to disguise himself because if he knew if somebody saw him, that they would see the king of Israel doing something that was against God's law. So he disguises himself, he goes to the medium, and he says, I need you to bring up through your magic and evoke the dead, the person that I will tell you of. All right, verse 9. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? Now here's this wicked woman, the wicked witch, I guess you could say, this medium who is satanic in nature, she's dealing with satanic things, and she has sense enough to know that she should not do this because she could get in trouble for it and, in fact, die. Isn't that it's just odd? It's so backward. She's the one saying, no, Saul said, and she's talking to Saul. Saul said, we're not supposed to do this. I don't want to die. You're trying to get me killed, mister. I don't think I should be involved in that. I don't want to die over this. And she's talking to the very man who had eradicated it. So odd, so shameful. And so she says, I don't want to get involved in it. I'll die. If they find out, I'll, I'll be gone. Verse 10. And Saul swore to her by the Lord. Ouch. He uses the Lord's name in an in a oath, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. How awful. Saul is swearing by God's name for a woman to do something satanic. He's willing to use God's name to swear to this satanic woman to do something that God has strictly forbidden in the land. It is abundantly clear how that Saul went from a pretty good man, a pretty good guy, head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel, a popular man that everybody wanted to be their king and God even allowed him to be the king, he sunk this low. And it should be a reminder to all of us that none of us are above sin. None of us are above trickling downward and downward and downward because by nature that's what we do. But Saul is swearing by God. He's willing to use God to get what he wants. Saul will use any means possible to get what he wants. Now here's a note of caution. We shouldn't be enamored with people who will use God to get what they want because they may just be willing to use Satan to get what they want. Um, many times, you, you know, you, you listen to a celebrity and uh, they give a, a speech after they get a reward, an award, and they'll, you know, I want to thank God, you know, and, and, and sometimes they sound convincing and I'm not here to say that there aren't people who win awards who aren't Christians. I'm not, I'm not here to say that. But I always find it interesting, the people whose lifestyle is one way, and then they want to get up and, and fall all over themselves thinking, it just, it just sends mixed signals, doesn't it? And uh, just be cautious. Um, again, I'm not saying we should be going around, you know, being skeptical of everybody, but be cautious with whom we give our allegiance to. Be cautious with whom we give influence in our lives to, because even though they say, oh, I'm a Christian, be very careful. Uh, because some people will use God and talk about God when it's convenient. And then they'll also be just as willing to go to the other side and be using satanic methods 
when it's convenient and when it works for their benefit. So just be careful with that. And Saul was sadly one of those people who was willing to use uh, good or evil to get whatever he wanted. So we continue. Verse 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. So he asks for her to bring up Samuel so he can have a conversation with him. So he can inquire of Samuel what God would have him to do. And when the woman, verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And, uh, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, what ha- Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. Now, he say, man, she, she actually brought Samuel back. No. I don't believe that's what that says there. I don't believe she brought Samuel back. I believe Samuel appeared and she freaked out. Notice, it doesn't say that she did anything. Notice the transition between the verses. Verse 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up to thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, it didn't say she said anything or did anything. Samuel's there and she shrieks. Not because she was expecting him, because she wasn't expecting that. She shrieks in fear. She cries with a loud voice. And she said, why have you deceived me? You're Saul. Now she finds all this out in this moment. So what really happened here? I believe that God brought Samuel to that moment and allowed him to speak the truth to Saul about his future. God can do what he wants. God can use any method to accomplish his his goals. And to accomplish his purpose. We've seen God do very strange things in the scriptures to accomplish his purposes. He made a donkey talk one time. That's pretty weird. Anybody seen a donkey talk? Yeah. That's pretty weird. That's uncommon. Could God do this? Absolutely. He had one last message for Saul. It wasn't about the war. It was about Saul. Well, she says, what have you done? You are Saul. Verse 13, and the king said unto her, be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Now, what in the world is she talking about there? Gods ascending out of the earth. Well, according to um, the Hittite records of mediums, when they would conjure up the dead spirits, Uh, That's how they described it. They saw lowercase g, gods, ascending and descending. So whether she actually saw him come up and go down or whatever the case may be, she was using terminology that would make her sound authenticated. She was saying what she supposed to say. Um, Like if you see a magician, somebody with sleight of hand. And they do a trick, and you say, how did you do that? And they say, it's magic. That's what they're supposed to say. But we know there's a trick to it. Well, she was saying what she was supposed to say, because that's kind of how they described it in those days when they would do something like this. So she said, I see God's ascending and descending out of the earth. Verse 14, and he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And that was his clue. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. She describes Samuel to Saul. She mentions his mantle, and it's a dead giveaway. No pun intended. Uh, It's a a giveaway that it is Samuel. And Saul then bows himself to Samuel. Saul is, as John Phillips put it, a big fool of a man. He bows himself down to Samuel. Verse 15, And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. He says, Well, God's left me, so now I, I need you to help me. And Samuel's coming at him from the standpoint of, why would you ask me when God has now become your enemy? 
you and God are not on the same page. Why are you asking me for your help? And he says, I need to know what to do about these Philistines. Verse 16, then says Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thy enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. You'll recall when Saul, back a while ago, when he uh, kept the king that he was supposed to wipe out, and he was supposed to wipe out all the herds and everything in the land, and he kept the king and he kept the herds, and you remember that when he began to walk away, uh, that he ripped Uh, Samuel's uh, uh, mantle and took a piece of it off and Samuel turned around and said just like you ripped my my mantle so will God take the kingdom from you and now this is happening it's being fulfilled just exactly what God had told Samuel to tell him then is happening in this moment he says he's given it unto thy neighbor even to David he put the knife in and he turned it if you will this is David's kingdom now Verse 18, because thou obeyedst not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. You've not obeyed the Lord, and you did not do what he told you to do. And that's why he will not answer you today. Verse 19, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. Notice, with thee into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. He says, this is the end, Saul. This is the end. You and your sons will be with me. What's he talking about? It's going to heaven? You recall the story, the account in the Bible of the rich man and Lazarus. When they died... The rich man went to hell. That word is translated Sheol, a holding place for the damned. And then there was Abraham's bosom where Lazarus went. They could see each other, but there was a great gulf fixed so that they could not pass from one to the other. At this point in time, all those who were dead went to this holding place until Christ died and First Peter tells us that he descended there, preached to those in prison, and then we remember um, at that point is when those uh, spirits there went to their final place. And so as we see here, when he said, you will be with me, he wasn't saying you'll be in heaven, we will be in the holding place, if you will, until that day comes. I can see you, you can see me, but there's a great gulf fixed. He reads to Saul, to Saul. he tells Saul, of his future this is it it the end has come well he says in verse 19 or we just read that so verse 20 then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel and there was no strength in him for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night so Saul is now crushed by the news His strength has left him. He had eaten nothing on his journeys there. And he's fallen to the ground. Let us note that if we continue to disobey God, what has already been revealed to us through his word, what would make us think that he will reveal secret things to us? Or reveal further things to us? If we disregard what he's already given us in black and white in his word, What makes us think that those deeper questions of his will, that he's going to be willing to shell those out? You see, we need to have a pattern of obedience. A pattern that says, God, I trust you. I trust you enough to believe the things you've already revealed unto me. And when he sees that we will do what he says, he's going to be more willing to reveal to us those things that are not black and white and cut and dry. And and Saul disregarded all the things that were black and white disregarded them pattern of of years and years of disregarding God's word and so God withheld from him that information that he wanted there at the end so we need to learn that knowing God's word is great but doing God's word is best develop a pattern of following God's word well at the end here Saul falls down there on the ground 21, and the woman came unto Saul and saw that he was sore troubled and said unto him behold thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice 
and I have put my life in thy hand, and have hearkened unto thy words, which thou, hast, uh, thou spakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat, that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on thy way. But he refused, and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, compelled him, and he hearkened unto her voice. So he arose from the earth, and sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house, and she hastened and killed it, and took flour and kneaded it, and then bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they did eat, and they rose up and went away that night. What we get here is a picture of Saul's last meal. This is the last time he would have something to eat before he would meet his maker, before he would die, before he would have that prophecy that was just given to him moments earlier, or he would go on. What a sad, sad ending. And we'll see it in, in next week, uh, the ending. But a couple of things to uh, note from this chapter, and we'll close tonight. First of all, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Uh, when we are afraid, the Bible says that's the moment we're supposed to trust in God. The Bible says, in what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And let that be our mantra. Let that be our saying as we go throughout this life. And those times when we do have those fears crop up and those temptations to give in, remember, trust in the Lord. Trust in God. He would not have us to fear. That's not his spirit. You know, we also saw here that fear can cause us to do things we wouldn't normally do. Fear can drive us to not be ourselves. And it certainly did to Saul. It put him in a position uh, that he never would have dreamed he would have been in. Seeking out a medium. We learned the lesson to be obedient to what we already know. A pattern of disobedience and lack of concern for God's word demonstrates to our, our heart to God that we're really not concerned with what he has to say. And may it be our desire that we wouldn't just want to know what he says, that we'd want to do what he says, so that he can trust us with more things and bigger and better things and be faithful in those little things so that we could be faithful in the big things. Trusting God, taking him at his word. Lessons from the life of Saul. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for opening our eyes, Lord, tonight to uh, this sad case of Saul. And, Lord, as we watch his continual spiral downward, it should send all kind of reminders and cautions to us of the principles of your word, Lord, that he just completely disobeyed and ignored and even went in the, in the face of. And, Lord, it's easy for us to look at Saul and just shake our heads and wonder how someone could be so disobedient and rebellious and awful and poor and bad and wicked and turn, turn on you in a moment. We wonder how that could be possible, but, Lord, it's within all of us. We are all in the same flesh. The Bible says we are all men of like passions. Lord, it's within all of us to go astray, to turn, to walk away, even to rebel and disobey. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart for you. Father, that we'd be obedient to your word, understanding that what you have decreed, what you have commanded is for our good. And, Father, if we would just trust and obey, if we listen to what you say and do what you say, Lord, we will be better for it. We cannot, we cannot make for ourselves better than what you have for us. And, Lord, I pray that you would give us understanding and wisdom lord that we would be prudent and just flat out obedient to you and lord um, i pray that in those moments where fears do arise uh, that you would give us faith and confidence in you our great guide and protector in jesus name we pray